Uh, Thank you. So uh, I will second your sentiments. We are delighted to have you, Jeff and Laura, and to welcome you and all of you actually heartily, albeit um, virtually. When we began planning this anti-Semitism initiative last summer, our primary goal was to educate ourselves, that is the members of Temple of Muna, to broaden, to deepen, update, but also to complicate and even challenge what we thought we knew or what we knew about anti-Semitism so that we'd be better able to take effective action both individually and collectively. Tonight's conversation is the seventh, so we think, um, event of this initiative. Uh, so that's since last October. And we're gearing up for a weekend of activity soon, which uh, Terry mentioned and maybe won't mention at the end of the, of the evening. Anti-Semitism is an equal opportunity phenomenon. It crosses geographical boundaries, demographic categories, race, ethnicity, age, income, and so forth, and political affiliation and orientation. Uh, it adapts and endures across centuries and centuries. The Jewish community's definition of the problem, for example, what behaviors are included and excluded, uh, who the worst perpetrators are, assessments of its relative danger, and the community's responses to it have varied over time and place as well, and, he, and among subgroups of Jews too, living in the same place at the same time. Today in the United States, some of us focus on, focus on anti-Semitism on the right, for example, on white supremacists, neo-Nazis, the dark web, Christian supersessionist theology and so forth, and others focus on anti-Semitism on the left, often on anti-Zionism and its many concomitants. Today's discuss tonight's discussion, when anti-Semitism comes from the left, uncomfortable as it is for some of us, promises to move us along that path. And so I thank you both for helping us there. Let me introduce the speakers. Uh, Jeff is local, so he probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I'm, I'm gonna do it anyway. Jeff Jacoby is an award-winning, several awards actually, a columnist for the Boston Globe, uh, we understand that uh, the Globe was seeking a conservative voice to balance its liberal roster of commentators, and the Globe hired Jeff away from the Boston Herald, where he had been the chief editorial writer. Today, his columns are widely distributed by the New York Times Syndicate. In addition he, to his newspaper column, Jeff also writes Arguable, a weekly email newsletter that was launched in, 19, in 2017 and now reaches about 100,000 subscribers. Jeff is a lawyer by training um, and is the child of a Holocaust survivor. His most recent column uh, appearing this Sunday, this just this past Sunday in the Boston Globe, I'm sure many of you read it, is entitled, Make No Mistake, Anti-Zionism is Anti-Semitism. In response to Amnesty International's recent characterization of Israel as an apartheid state, Jeff argues um, what he sees as the obvious, that anti-Semitism is only the latest manifestation of, of anti-Semitism, and, and we need to call it out as such. He concludes as follows, quote, a relentless obsession with Israel's sins, real and imagined, the denial that Jews are entitled to Jewish sovereignty. These are not mere expressions of opinion, they are expressions of bigotry against the Jewish people. Laura Atkins is also an award-winning writer and editor based in New York. She's the, the opinion editor for The Forward and an adjunct professor of journalism at Yeshiva University. Her writing on anti-Semitism, Orthodox Jewry, gender, and other issues has, have, has appeared in the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Washington Post, and elsewhere. She was previously opinion editor of the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, the editor of Jewish Insider, and an assistant blogs editor at the Times of Israel. Her most recent opinion essay, which was published yesterday in the forward, is entitled, APAC's endorsements risk irreparable, irreparably damaging the US-Israel relationship. It underscores the dangers of APAC's uh, recent policy decision to, among other actions, endorsed 37 members of Congress who actively supported Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 national election. She warns of the consequences that a diminished US democracy might likely have for US supported Israel. We are honored to have both of you. Thanks for joining us. So here's the format. 
essentially we're being invited. This is makes it me, a, an easy job for us. Essentially, we are being invited to eavesdrop on a conversation between two colleagues, two seasoned journalists who have thought long and hard about this issue and have written about it on many occasions. They have set their own agenda. It, it's safe to say that their views differ, but we'll be able to determine for ourselves how and how much. After about 30 or 35 minutes, we'll open the floor for questions. Because of the size of the group, as Terry said, we won't be able to call on you to ask your questions directly. Rather, we ask you to note your questions in the chat, and I'll try to choose questions that represent the range of issues and concerns represented there. Please keep your questions short, and if you can, keep them as actual questions. Terry will conclude the event more or less promptly at 9.15. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Jeff and Laura. Fran, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you both for everything that you've done to make this whole event possible and for uh, the, uh, the joyfulness and the friendliness and the, um, the wit with which uh, I was able to enjoy the uh, preparations that led up to this thing. I only wish that we were here to talk about a joyful, cheerful, uplifting topic. Um, but if, if life were full of joy and, and goodness, then, uh, then, you know, what would people who worry about stuff professionally for a living do with themselves so laura and i only have known each other previously by byline and by our work so laura it's great to to be able to engage in a conversation like this for the first time with you in yes. front of more than, in front of more than 100 people who have uh, tuned into to eavesdrop as as frank yes. um so this whole question about anti-semitism on the right anti-semitism on the left i'm i'm gonna guess i'm gonna assume that everybody tuning in uh, to us tonight, um, pretty much everyone we know would agree that right-wing anti-Semitism is a very real, very serious, and sometimes very deadly phenomenon. Um, Fran mentioned uh, some examples, and we can add so many more to them, the Tree of Life massacre in Pittsburgh, and the Chabad of Poway uh, shooting in California, uh, Charlottesville, Jews will not replace us, neo-Nazis, the whole business. The synagogue that I go to, like so many shuls, and so many Jewish day schools today is now kept locked at all times or under guard. Um, I can remember when I went to Germany for the first time years ago, and I was struck by the phenomenon of armed guards in front of every shul. And I remember at the time debating with myself, is it a good thing now that Jews in Germany are protected when they daven, or is it a sign of something to be really fearful about, that even today, Jews in Germany aren't safe when they when they go to pray. And now here we are in America, and for many of us, this has become a phenomenon. Um, so, of course, rising anti-Semitism is a hugely grave and serious problem. But I think, just to amplify what Fran said in introducing us, I think that for many people, and especially many people in the Jewish community, it's convenient to think that anti-Semitism or bigotry against Jews is mainly a phenomenon on the right. And to me, that's a dangerous delusion. And I don't think it's one that we can afford to indulge in, which is why you and I are here to, to talk about this. So let me just throw out two examples of episodes that happened very recently, and we'll see where that takes us. Um, Fran mentioned my most recent column. I talked about Paul O'Brien, who's the executive director of Amnesty International USA. He was speaking to a women's democratic group in Washington just about a week or so ago. And in the course of his remarks, he was there to talk about the, uh, the, uh, the amnesty report that accused Israel of apartheid, uh, which itself I think is, 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 a, is a marker of anti-Semitism. But in the course of his remarks, he said that Israel quote unquote, shouldn't exist as a Jewish state. He actually repeated it a couple of times. He even went so far as to say that in his view, he actually attributed to his gut. So in his kishkas, most American Jews don't actually believe that Israel needs to be a Jewish state. And my reaction on reading that was to think he would never have said, he would never say today that the Irish people don't need Ireland to be an Irish state. He would never say that Ukrainian people don't need a state of their own. And yet he has no problem dismissing the Jewishness of the Jewish state as unnecessary. And I would suggest that when the only country in the world whose existence or raison d'etre you have a problem with 
just happens to be the world's only Jewish country, that that's by definition anti-Semitism. So that's one recent event. Here's a second one. Last month, Louisville, Kentucky, Craig Greenberg is a candidate for mayor of Kentucky, uh, 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 mayor, of Kentu- mayor of Louisville, and his campaign headquarters were invaded by a Black Lives Matter activist named Quintez Brown, who opened fire, shot several times at the candidate. Uh, thank God nobody was killed, nobody was, was badly hurt. Um, but he was arrested for attempted murder, this Quintez Brown, and he was promptly bailed out by the local Black Lives Matter chapter. What One of the things that struck me about this was that Quintez Brown, first of all, was not some crazy marginal character that nobody would ever take seriously. He had been taken seriously, although he's a young man, he's been taken seriously for quite a while. For a while, at least, he had a regular column in the local Louisville newspaper. Um, He's appeared on MSNBC, being interviewed in in connection with causes that he cares about. Gun control is one of them. Uh, Anti-racism is one of them. But to judge from his social media, he's also a raging anti-Semite. And so here you have a Black Lives Matter activist who's also an avowed anti-Semite opening fire, trying to murder a Jewish candidate for mayor. And the story basically disappeared within 36 hours. There's been almost nothing, I presume locally in the Louisville press, it continues to get covered, but it certainly never has not become a sustained national story. So maybe we start with that. Why does anti-Semitism tend to be downplayed so much when it comes from the left? Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff, for framing it. And again, Fran and Terry for, for having us here. I want to take a step back in answering your question um, and, and really clearly define some terms here, because I think it'll be helpful as we go forward. Um, so first of all, it's important to remember that ideologically motivated attacks when it comes to anti-Semitism are actually not the majority of hate crimes at all. Um, Most recent op-eds and studies have shown, particularly in New York, where the largest percentage of these violent assaults take place are either local juveniles and or those with mental health issues. And this is a whole different topic and I'm sure we'll get to it a little bit tonight, but when we're talking about ideologically motivated attacks, um, I want you to think of left-wing anti-Semitism like a slow spreading cancer and right-wing anti-Semitism basically like a house fire. Um, Right-wing anti-Semitism, at least in this country, has been the animating ideology behind almost all of the mass casualty anti-Semitic attacks in recent years. Um, However, left-wing anti-Semitism, and the example Jeff opened with was a good one because not only is it more insidious and a bit harder to recognize, but it's much more prevalent abroad than it is in the United States, at least historically. There was a really scary, fascinating essay by Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic in 2015 entitled, Is It Time? for the Jews to leave Europe that that evoked a lot of the scenes that Jeff mentioned of needing armed guards to pray and stuff like that. And reading it in 2015, and when I used to read it with my students, um, it was more of a thank God that's not a reality. And now, unfortunately, for a lot of us, it is. So just to talk about you know, these things in broad strokes, I, I want to hammer in on what we mean when we say anti-Semitism. Um, when I use the term, and my understanding of it is based primarily on the scholarship of Deborah Lipstadt, um, anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory. And this is why it permeates both sides of the political spectrum. It's a conspiracy theory that we Jews have outsized and nefarious influence on the world. And remembering this can help us more easily identify it when we see it, because one of the tricky things about left-wing anti-Semitism, at least so far in this country, is sometimes it's either very hard to identify or people try to wiggle their way out of it. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that now. So when I say left-wing, I mean events 
or ideas that are motivated by a specific ideology that's left-wing, like communism, socialism, progressivism. The Black Lives Matter example is a good one. Um, extreme cases of this would be like Jeremy Corbyn of the Labour Party, who, you know, England's Human Rights Commission found um, let unlawful ass act of harassment and discrimination take place against Jewish members of his party. Um, but a domestic example would be the spike in anti-Semitic violence during the recent war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Um, the Anti-Defamation League really closely tracks incidents that take place and they, they counted about 251 separate incidents of anti-Semitism um, between I believe May 11th and the end of the conflict. So it's, it's real and it's countable, but there are examples of it that are a little bit harder to pin down. I wanna talk about the Amnesty International example that Jeff brought up, because this is to me an example of someone saying the quiet part out loud, right? When you read these human rights reports, and I think it's perfectly legitimate for these human rights organizations to critique specific Israeli policies or the policies of any government. And I am in the minority on this, but I even think the use of the term apartheid, while I think it's inaccurate, that to me does not cross the line into anti-Semitism. But here's what is anti-Semitic to me about um, the Amnesty International directors remarks. And my friend Amanda Berman, who runs Zioness, was at the event and really pressed him on his framing. And it's not that they view certain conduct in Israel as unacceptable. It's that they uniquely believe that the Jewish state, unlike China, Russia, others that commit human rights violations, they uniquely believe that the Jewish state should not exist because of the discrimination. So in my view, at least, critiquing Israel even harshly is not anti-Semitic. Holding it to a double standard is. I'm sure many of us know the famous three Ds from Natan Sharansky, which was his test for deciding whether or not criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. It's, does it delegitimize Israel? Does it hold it to a double standard? And does it demonize Israel? And different people draw the line in different places. But you know, another example of Amnesty doing this is they hosted protests outside of the Israeli embassy recently, but not outside of the Russian embassy, who is actively trying to erase the Ukrainian democracy and people off of the map. So I think it's important to keep in mind when we're looking at things that relate to Israel, it's sometimes gonna be either harder to identify what counts as anti-Semitism or just there's gonna be massive disagreement. Now, the, the case of Quintez Brown and his awful attempted murder of Craig Greenberg um, highlights a couple of things that are important. Um, so I report a lot about hate crimes, particularly incidents of assault that happen in New York City on the Orthodox community. And every time there's one of these awful incidents, the community is rightly outraged if it's not immediately called a hate crime. And the issue is it's actually sometimes to determine, difficult to determine whether or not something was motivated by a particular hate. Sometimes, unfortunately, it's just a mentally disturbed person attacking someone in sight. Now, we later found that this was not at all the case with Quintez Brown. He was indeed affiliated with what I consider a far left group, but I would actually hesitate to be upset when an attack on, on any individual is not immediately characterized as a hate crime, because it's actually a difficult process to determine whether or not it was a random attack or whether or not it was actually animated by hate. But I want to go back to the, the amnesty example for a second, Jeff, because I, I feel like this is probably the area where within the Jewish community, there's, there's the most um, debate. What are some of the tests other than 
Sharansky's 3Ds test that you yourself use when considering whether or not criticism of Israel crosses a line? I think the 3D test is perfect. I, I like it better than the IRA uh, definition. I think that when you see Israel being treated in ways that no other country is treated, uh, that's that's the that's the litmus test right there. Um, which is why, you know, as I said, Paul O'Brien would never say that the Irish people don't deserve a state of their own. You know, I wrote in this in, in my column last week that what is taken for granted about peoples all over the world, that Poles should have a state of their own, that Mexicans should have a state of their own, uh, you, you know, that Iranians should have a state of their own, that Palestinians should have a state of their own, as countless people say. And yet when it comes to Israel, from the day Israel was born, we've had debates about whether Israel even has a quote unquote right to exist. I, I've been reading uh, Yehuda Agner's uh, uh, tremendous book, The Prime Ministers, about uh, about the Israeli prime ministers that he worked for. And I just just today, have, on my long drive back uh, back to Boston from, uh, from, from out of town, I was reading his chapter in which he's talking about Menachem Begin uh, erupting with outrage at the suggestion that Israel's right to exist should even be a subject for discussion. So I think I might draw the line a lot, a lot closer or a lot less generously than you do. If someone is speaking about Israel, referring to Israel's supporters, uh, defining Israel's policies, or using language to describe Israel uh, in ways that, that that person or that organization never does about other countries, then I think that that's a textbook example of anti-Semitism. And, and I think it's, I mean, I think it's important to say anti-Semitism, uh, you know, your, your, your line about um, a slow growing, slow moving, slow growing cancer versus a house fire. I think it's a great analogy. It's true. The, the deadliest uh, anti-Semitic anti-Semit, anti attacks or anti-Semitic up, you know, up, outbursts that we've seen in this country where guns are fired and people are killed. The worst of those have clearly been from the right. Uh, but the slow moving cancer in some ways I would say is scarier. Cancer kills a hell of a lot more people in this country every year than house fires do. And when you see anti-Semitism being inculcated uh, on college campuses where future generations of political leaders and business leaders and media leaders uh, are, are being indoctrinated with, with the kind of baseline hostility toward or or uh, uh, or suspicion of Jews or the Jewish state that they're likely to carry with them for the rest of their lives, the damage that that will cause is just incalculable. I, you know, you, you, um, uh, you mentioned this isn't brand new, but that it's gotten a lot worse since you first began talking about it with your students. Uh, I, I had a column some, maybe it was half a year ago, when San Francisco State University, some class, some some course professor on that campus wanted to bring Leila Khalid in as a guest speaker via Zoom. Leila Khalid, for those who don't recognize the name, uh, was, is a notorious Palestinian terrorist. She was involved in, in hijackings. Uh, to this day, she, she spews the, the most vicious kind of uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-Zionist rhetoric. And in the course of writing about uh, this professor who wanted to bring Leila Khalid in to speak to her students, I quoted something that had been published um how long ago was this i looked it up while we were getting ready here 2002 so that's 20 years ago from that very campus san francisco state university a faculty member named Lori zoloff wrote that her university was turning into quote a venue for hate speech and anti-semitism and she wrote about, quote, how isolating, how terrifying it has become to live as a Jew on this campus. That was 20 years ago. Now, consider everything that's been laid down in the 20 years since then. All the students that have gone through courses like this, that have experienced this, multiplied by so many other college campuses around the country. Uh, what, what impact is that having on society? It, it seems to me, I, I really like your analogy about the slow growing cancer, but maybe I like it you know, using the word like in quotation marks, because cancer in many ways these days is so much more frightening than the house fires. It's a really good point. And I think a lot of this is, I'm a numbers person. It's really hard to quantify um, just how 
much this problem is really an insidious problem. I was at NYU um, from 2012 to 2016. And oh man, you're young. I know. And I was very active in the pro-Israel group that was APAC aligned, but pretty much worked with everyone. And I remember I hosted a debate with um, Noah Pollock and Peter Beinart, who was then a bit more mainstream. And I had no trouble getting the college Republicans, the college Democrats, the political debate society, even the college libertarians to sign on, give a part of their budget um, to host this debate about Israel policy. And we generally had pretty good relationships on campus. Um, there was an active and vocal Students for Justice in Palestine chapter, and I was very publicly involved in calling them out for anti-Semitism when they distributed um, mock eviction notices under students' doors. Um, however, I didn't feel like the presence of Students for Justice in Palestine and even their virulent, I think, anti-Semitism actually affected my day-to-day -day college experience so much. I studied economics. Most students in my classes were not necessarily politically active. They were focused on their coursework. Um, but I think fast forward five, six years, and I hear a lot more cases, for example, like when the pro-Israel club at NYU tried to host a Yom Hatzmut celebration, they were shouted down or, you know, people are much more aggressive and pushy. And again, this is New York City in a liberal campus. And I'm originally from Missouri and my friends who go to school in the South and the Midwest don't necessarily have the same experience. But of course, it, it's small comfort that it hasn't metastasized beyond um, kind of the liberal elite bubble, but I think a part of this that, Jeff, I'm curious to hear a bit more of your perspective on also is, to me, the, the root cause of kind of this more virulent pushback um, is a still small but growing percentage of people within the Democratic Party who take positions that are really hostile to Israel, particularly millennials and Gen X people. Um, but are there other factors that contribute to creating this, this culture? There, well, there's no question that there has been a change in, in how the two major political parties uh, comport themselves when it comes to, especially when it comes to Israel. Um, and I think that the, the, the hyperpolarization of American politics has in part fueled uh, the, some of what we're talking about here. So, for example, I, somewhere here, um, somewhere in my, you know, in my notes that I couldn't possibly find what we were talking, Pew, the Pew Research Center, uh, had a survey maybe a year or two ago in which they were testing on a whole bunch of issues. Um, one of them was support for Israel versus support in the Middle East conflict, the question was, are your sympathies more with Israel or more with the Palestinians? And among people who self-identified as conservative Republicans, sympathy was overwhelmingly more for Israel. Among people who self-identified as liberal Democrats, sympathy was overwhelmingly more for the Palestinians. There's been a real polarization about this. And speaking as a Zionist, um, I find this heartbreaking. You know, I've got, I've got my political views and and you know they're on, on on many issues they're different from you know a lot of my friends who are uh, who are liberals or who are democrats um and these days from many of my friends who are republicans but one issue that i had always uh it used to be that you know you could you could cherish the idea that one thing that was pretty much a, you know not nonpartisan or bipartisan in america was support for israel that had become pretty much the default uh but then it all began to change. I would say as as the progressive edge of the left began to take over more and more of the mainstream left. And we're left now with a situation in which it's much more likely that you're going to support Israel if you're 
uh, conservative or if you're Republican, and much less likely if you're Democrat or if you're a liberal. And I don't at all mean to suggest that there are plenty of liberals and plenty of Democrats who aren't supportive of Israel and who aren't as outraged by unfair attacks on Israel as 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 the rest of us would be. Um, but, you know, think about what happened when um, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar uncorked those really vile comments. Uh, it was it last year, two years ago, about uh, why their support for Israel in the U.S. Congress, suggesting that dual loyalty is involved or greater loyalty among Jews to Israel, suggesting that it was because they were being paid off. Uh, Omar's famous comment about it's all about the Benjamins, baby. And you remember that there was the immediate reaction when those comments became public was that they should be censured in much the way I would say that the Republican Party has censured, what's her name, Marjorie Taylor Greene for some of the outrageous comments outrageously anti-Semitic comments that she's made. And yet in less than 24 hours, it became impossible within the Democratic caucus to actually have a clear cut statement of censure of those you know, members of the squad for anti-Semitic comments. And in the end, it, you know, the, 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 the resolution was watered down to include every conceivable kind of bigotry and and, uh, and, you know, and, and hostility and racism that you could imagine. And when you're condemning everybody, you're essentially condemning nobody. And it seems to me that that has become, uh, that that's indicative of the problem on the left, uh, that it's become politically dangerous in many cases to overtly and clearly and unambiguously condemn anti-Semitism when it also comes from the left. And I'm not sure what's going to change that, especially as the two parties grow more and more polarized and more and more of the Republican Party is taken over by the hard right, and more and more of the Democratic Party is taken over by the hard left, and they both have the instinct to oppose anything that the others do. Uh, it, it 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 strikes me as something really worrisome because I'm not sure where, you know, where the off ramp is going to be for anyone, or how either side is going to be able to manage their way back to a, you know, back to a back to a joint understanding of the dangers of anti-Semitism, no matter which side of the spectrum it comes from. Let me start where I agree with you. I, I think it was very disappointing that um, although Ilhan Omar's comments were widely condemned by over a dozen members of her party, the final resolution lumped it in with other forms of hatred, which was A, inappropriate, B, regrettable. Um, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, I think we are seeing not only increasing polarization among um, individual members of our society, but we're also seeing extremists and their voices amplified um, within each party. And right. I, I would chalk a lot of this honestly up to the ability for social media platform to be used as a tool to amplify the least nuanced beliefs. Um, but I, you know, I also would push back a little bit on the idea that um, support for Israel is, is significantly lower in the Democratic Party. I, I'll share a link in the chat, but I actually covered um, in 2018 the way that Gallup and Pew measure support for Israel differently. Um, and depending on whether you ask who you sympathize more with or um, whether or not you support Israel, you get very different answers. But I don't wanna try to, to explain away the problem with data, but I, I think that something that's very heartening that I wrote about a bit in um, my piece yesterday is that the vast majority of members of both parties in Congress um, still overwhelmingly vote for every piece of pro Israel legislation, which I don't think we can take for granted because that was certainly not always the case. Um, what I think the Democratic Party has shown an inability to do, and it's a similar problem to what the Republican Party has shown an inability to do, is call out the fringe voices within their party as fringe. And I'm not sure exactly why that is, and I certainly don't want to do whataboutism and both sides this, but if you look at, you know, the average American is, when compared to other liberal Western democracies, actually like fairly conservative. Um, we don't 
have a mainstream socialist party in this country. We do have a socialist group growing within the progressive caucus, but if you look at how the average voter self-identifies, they self-identify as either independent or a lot, even within the Democratic Party, identify surprisingly as conservative. Um, that obviously doesn't mean they're, you know, anti-abortion and pro-guns necessarily, but I think the average American is not what we're talking about when we're talking about this growing sentiment of hatred for Israel. Um, I do think that within academia and more mainstream, I'll say mainstream elite circles, um, these views have gotten a lot more support than they have. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and I, I agree with you. It's not, it's not the average American that I'm concerned about when, I, when I'm concerned about anti-Semitism from the right or from the left. This country, for you know, even though there's a rising tide of anti-Semitism worldwide, and there has been much of it in this country, this country still remains the greatest, most welcoming, safest country that Jews have ever lived in, uh, not counting Israel, in 2,000 years of, of the diaspora. Um, and um, I mean, I, I, I am so grateful as someone whose father was a refugee, a survivor of Auschwitz and a refugee from Europe, I'm so grateful that America is like that. Um, my experience of, of my fellow Americans has been overwhelmingly a positive one. And I can't think that most, most American Jews would say that. It, it's absolutely, as you say, a problem among the elites. The problem is that it's the elites who make policy. It's the elites who establish universities. It's the elites who train diplomats. It's the elites who, who staff editorial boards at newspapers. It's the elites who write newspaper columns. It's the elites who are in charge of programming on, you know, on, on television. And it, it's what hap it's what's happening among left leaning elites that that causes me to worry so much about this rising tide of left wing anti semitism. You know, you you quoted um, um, Deborah Lipstadt before, and her formula her formulation that anti semitism is uh, is a conspiracy theory. I don't have any argument. You know, I don't have any problem with that. I just don't think that it that it gets us very far. So you cannot. You can define anti-Semitism in its various forms as a kind of conspiracy theory, or you can define it as I'm more inclined to as simply a derangement. But in either case, you're left with um, with with something that has seized people's minds, and and that's that that I don't see an obvious antidote to. And you know, we Jews have been talking forever about. How do you respond to anti-Semitism? How do you cure anti-Semitism? How do you subdue anti-Semitism? If there were a clear, obvious, and easy answer to this question, we would have done it a long time ago. Uh, I think it's it's almost by definition, whether you call it a conspiracy theory or a derangement, almost by definition, that's something that doesn't lend itself easily to being talked out of. Um, sometimes it takes a catac cataclysmic event to, um, to be able to, to, to put the kibosh on something like that. Uh, I think, for example, of the post-Holocaust taboo in the West against overt, naked anti-Semitism, which is the, the environment that I grew up in. You know, I, you know, I was born a decade and a half after the Holocaust ended, and I grew up in an America in which the idea that you would have to have armed guards or keep synagogues locked all the time would simply have been inconceivable. And what I find myself thinking now Increasingly, is that I was just living through, I was living through a through an exceptional period, and that now we're reverting back to the, you know, back to the back to the norm, reverting to the mean, whatever the the, the expression is, and the the norm has always been, um, as as Fran said when she introduced us, that anti-Semitism, hatred of Jews, bigotry against Jews or against the Jewish people or against the Jewish religion has always crossed all borders, and it has always been able to infect all demographics. And I find myself thinking now, as I never used to have to think when I was growing up, that this is now a problem that American Jews are going to be wrestling with going forward. And I'll and just to be even more apocalyptic about it, I've studied a lot of Jewish history, and I honestly cannot think of any period in the history of the Jewish people when anti-Semitism was on the rise, when attacks on Jews and on Jewish institutions um, was growing, when 
the process arrested itself and reversed. I can't think of any time in Jewish history when anti-Semitism was getting worse and worse and worse. And then people came up with a solution and stopped and they were able to roll it back. Instead, it almost always leads to something disastrous. And I hate to feel so, uh, uh, so, so, uh, I don't know, is there, is there an adjectival form for, you know, like a Jeremiah? I, I, I hate to feel that there's something really terrible and cataclysmic that's coming, but I, I'm not sure that history gives me gives me something more optimistic to look forward to. Okay, so can I uh, in, can I hop in now? Oh my god! On that god. cheerful note. Uh, on that cheerful note, fair it's fair enough. Um, I have a couple of um, questions. I, I, I was going to ask a question, but actually we've got some really good ones. So let me use what we have in the chat, and we'll go and and we'll go forward from there. Um, uh, so one person asks about the extent to which uh, West Bank settlements or Israeli policy in other, in other ways, but particularly Western uh, settlements uh, influences the way the left sees Israel and how much, uh, how much influence that has on the events that we're witnessing now. Uh, all right, I'll jump first and I'll say I think it has almost no real influence, no real impact. I know that the argument is made all the time. I've been hearing that argument forever, but the, but the contrary evidence is so incredibly strong. There were no settlements before 1977. There was plenty of anti-Zionism, violent anti-Zionism before 1977. In 2005, Israel withdrew completely, 100% from the Gaza Strip. Not only did it withdraw, it demolished, uh, I think, 22 or 23 um, Jewish communities that were in the Gaza Strip and sent in the IDF to remove the nine, between nine and 10,000 Israeli Jews who were living there. And yet to this day, so that was 17 years ago. Is that right? 2005, 17 years ago. And yet to this day, you hear talk about the occupation of Gaza as a reason why, uh, you know, why so many people turn against. Uh, so turn that's against not, so it's not compelling to you. It, it, to, is it to you, Laura? Yeah, I, you know, it's difficult because if we imagine that anti-Semites like us um, give the benefit of the doubt, then yeah, okay, fine. I can see why, you know, Israel doing something that in my view actively undermines prospects for a two-state solution um, would be upsetting. But that's that's not actually how anti-Semites think. I think it's definitely increased anti-Israel remarks or criticism of Israel in stronger ways than in the recent past within the Jewish community, motivated by good intentions, but I, I definitely think that most of the people who are advocating against settlements or using it as a reason to oppose Israel um, would also agree that the state of Palestine should exist from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, which means no Israel at all, settlements aside. And I, you know, I actually want to, I, I was thinking of, of time periods in Jewish history where anti-Semitic sentiment has changed. And I, I actually think the United States is a good example of that. Um, they've actually done public opinion surveys in the United States on anti-Semitic attitudes since the 20s. Um, and it, of course, you know, pre-Holocaust, there were very low opinions of, of Jews, 60% of Americans um, in the 1938 poll uh, said that Jews are greedy and dishonest. And we actually didn't see a turnaround in public opinion towards Jews until um, way after the civil rights movement. But you actually do see that American Jews today are in public opinion polls, not that we should have to care about such a thing, but are, are one of the most beloved um, groups of Americans or, or the most well regarded by the average citizen. And I, I think that that is a very clear consequence of a push for liberal democracy and 
diversity in the recent past. Um, so I, I am optimistic that the shift can be righted or, or turned if we focus on strengthening the things that got us to where we are today in that regard. Ah, so if so, you raise, um, uh, there are a couple of co questions and comments about, so kind of what can we do? What can we do? And I, I, you know, and 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 I don't know, Jeff, if you remember way early on when we were first talking about this, you, I said, what can we do? And you said, uh, proselytize and convert. Do, do you remember that? And I can't I tell whether you were being- where Sounds like was, something I would say. Drop the, the prohibition against uh, proselytizing and, uh, you know, and uh, right. So that, that, that was maybe flip, but, but, there are no no i love God. i love jews by choice i think the more of them we can we can attract the better off we'll be the better off there the world go. will be there we go so but in addition to that have you thought about what what is what would write this ship laura and particularly what would be compelling to to um people on the left who have these very strong feelings it's a really good question. Um, I think there's the Jewish answer and then the pragmatic Jewish answer. So um, my, I guess, more speaking to each other answer is, I think, focusing on, you know, strengthening the parts of Jewish observance that are particularly meaningful, being a part of a community, having very intentional, strong community where you can come together in a realistic way is a good way to show future generations of Jews that being a Jew is not just about anti-Semitism because who would want to stay it's in a not a big deal. Yeah. Just about other people hating us. But I think in a more practical perspective, something that I really appreciated about the way that APAC operated um, when I felt it was being a wise political actor is that it very intentionally built relationships with um, for example, leaders at historically black colleges and universities with the Hispanic community, with pastors in the deep south, with black pastors on the northeast, with a bunch of other groups who fundamental to their identity is a shared idea of struggle, but also fundamental to their present is a recognition that supporting Israel benefits the democracy that we have here and is built on shared values. So I think it's really important not to spend so much time fighting um, what my good friend and former campus director at APAC used to refer to as the Israel bashers, that we, we lose sight of building connections with the people that are actually very open to um, Judaism and to Israel and to building shared relationships. I'm not sure that I agree. I'm going to give you a different answer. I think that I'll offer two, two, two suggestions as well. I think that one focus for those of us who care about this issue, one focus for the Jewish community should be to go full tilt at the double standard by which some kinds of anti-Semitism and some kinds of anti-Semitic players get played up and focused on and demonized and attacked rightly. And the way other kinds of anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic actors uh, make people uncomfortable and tend not to get covered. So we, you know, we began by talking about um, uh, Black Lives Matter and, and uh, what was his name, uh, uh, Quintez Brown in 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 Louisville. Um, how many people know that the Black Lives Matter platform contained a, a vehement denunciation of Israel? An organization that I think most people would assume, based on the news coverage, focuses exclusively on domestic politics and domestic issues and has nothing to do with foreign policy, it goes out of its way to, to describe Israel as a genocide committing uh, country. Uh, I think just to use that as an, as an illustration, there's a real discomfort in many segments of society, especially on the left, especially among the elites that Laura was talking about before, with acknowledging anti-Semitism in the black community. Anti-Semitism in the black community is not at all a new phenomenon. Years and years ago, Henry Louis Gates, Skip Gates, the, the, the famous um, African-American studies professor that used to be uh, at Harvard. Uh, I remember reading an article that he wrote back in the 90s about how black Americans were twice as likely 
as white Americans to harbor anti-Semitic feelings. This is one of the leading black scholars in America talking about the black community. And yet to bring up that subject in, in so many venues today is just, is just not done. I think one, one part of the solution has to be to not stand for that kind of double standard. And when there are, when there are, when there's bigotry expressed against Jews that come from, uh, from groups that are otherwise regarded as underprivileged or underserved or victimized or victims themselves of racism or bigotry that we don't just say, okay, you know, they, they get a pass. So that's number one. Um, uh, number two, more broadly speaking, I think that one of the, one of the greatest dangers that the Jewish community faces here or anywhere is the growing, the rising tide of illiberalism. I don't mean liberal, illiberal in the left versus right sense. I mean, in the, in the you know, small L, small D, liberal democracy sense in which uh, a society values um, competing opinions and, and values freedom of speech and values robust debate. And there is this illiberalism that's been growing in America more and more in recent years in which too many topics are simply regarded as not open for discussion. I don't mean just topics having to do with Israel or having to do with Jews. On college campuses everywhere, you see a speaker is invited and huge mobs turn out to scream and yell and, and shout him or her down because they don't even want the subject to be discussed. Laura was talking before about uh, programs that she uh, attended on campus when she was a student. I can tell you, as somebody who went to college in the, in the mid, late 1970s, it was taken for granted that you could have speakers brought in from the right and from the left and you know in, in the center and Republicans and Democrats and students turned out en masse to hear them speak. And the idea that you would try to drown out a speaker or stage protests because you didn't want to hear an opinion expressed that wasn't your own uh, was simply unthinkable. I think for Jews in particular, illiberalism, life in an illiberal society where free speech is not regarded as a preeminent value is terribly, terribly dangerous. I began talking about this a lot in 2016 during the presidential campaign that year. And I can remember going before Jewish audiences and saying that if Donald Trump was elected president and just full disclosure, I didn't support Trump. I didn't support Hillary Clinton. As you know, as, as, as my readers know, I, you know, I, I couldn't stand either one of them. Uh, but for all that Donald Trump was talking about supporting Israel, I expressed the concern to one audience after another that he is a candidate who was supported by a kind of mob appeal. And mob appeals are always terrible for Jews. And look what's happened in the, in the six years since then. So my argument would be, or my suggestion would be, whatever we can do to reverse this growing, this growing trend toward shutting down unpopular opinion, Whatever we can do to open up the, the venue of, uh, of, of you know, civil discourse and, and civil society to be able to talk about things and to, listen, to be willing to listen to views and ideas and speakers, even those that we don't agree with, if, if we can't regain that ability, then I think it's, Jews will be among those who will suffer the most. I can't agree with Jeff Moore. I, I think that you know, it, it was it was really sad to watch over you know the past five years not that people lost friendships over the election because i think there actually was a, a pretty clear moral choice um to be made about supporting particular candidates but the fact that it's very rare to even be able to have a conversation about an issue that is purely a policy issue with people that you disagree with without facing a chorus of online harassment. Um, and that, you know, novelists can get canceled for expressing views on any political topic. And I think part of that- And the, and the editorial page editor of the New York Times can lose his job because he ran an opinion piece by a US Senator. What, right. what I, I, I think come to? it ties into um, also we, we have to all be less squeamish about calling out double standards. And it's very difficult because mm. it's it's very hard. I mean, it's very hard to call out something that doesn't align with your view of the world. I think many journalists, you know, reflexively when um, 
you know, the Muncie stabbing happened, reflexively tweeted, um, we got to get rid of white nationalism. It ended up being a black nationalist extremist event. And we have to be really careful, A, to be accurate, B, to question our own patterns about how we see the world, but C, also to not be so squeamish about when something happens within our own party, when something happens, you know, Absolutely. within our own friend group. We, we need to be less squeamish about calling out bigotry and, and double standards and, and attempts to silence people for expressing legitimate beliefs. So, so you were both uh, representatives of the media. I, 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 how much responsibility, I know the media in quotes, but how should we be thinking about the media as a potential uh, a piece of the solution or how much of it is a piece of the problem? And, uh, and is there any, do we have any purchase there? Um, that's a big question. I mean, the, the, if I can leave you with nothing else, if you appreciate the news and reporting delivered by a particular outlet, you should subscribe to that outlet because the entire revenue model of journalism is collapsing or has collapsed. And the reason that the most virulent views often float to the top is because there's not money in nuance without reader supported journalism. And that is not a plug specifically for the forward. That is, you know, we see a lot of this has to do with a crisis in local journalism. And when you are moving too quickly and covering things from a national perspective, you often get basic facts of a story wrong that often end up having damaging consequences. Like for example, missing that this attempted murderer of the politician had all these black nationalist beliefs that a more diligent reporter may have picked up on much more quickly. Um, I, I would just caution against, I know Fran, you didn't do this, but anytime you say the media, um, you know- I always put it in quotes. Uh, yes, yes, I mean, but you know, probably the biggest by eyeballs media is Rupert Murdoch's Fox News, Wall Street Journal empire. You can use the media as shorthand for the New York Times and Washington Post. So I would just encourage folks, and I do this too, everyone I think does it, be very specific in your critique of what is happening so you don't undermine the work of journalists actually um, doing a good job on uncovering issues. One answer that I've always given when asked about the media and what to do specifically about hostility to Israel that, that crops up in so much of the media. For years, I've said to people, especially when talking to, to students, um, if you don't like what you see in the media, consider going into it. I did, Laura did, um, you know, how much influence we have can be debated, uh, but you have more influence on the inside than you do on the outside as a critic. That said, the media in quotes these days has become as polarized as everything else. There is primarily left-wing media for left-wing readers and left-wing viewers and right-wing media for right-wing viewers and right-wing readers. And increasingly there's, you know, there's not much, not a whole lot of overlap. Um, it's it's all part of this the general rise of, of illiberalism in, in this society. But I would say, you know, at least to those those among our audience who are younger or who have you know, kids or grandchildren who are thinking about careers, consider going into the media and trying to make it better. That might be, you know, that's not that's not a short snap of the finger solution, but long term, maybe that's the best one of all. And also, if I can just add to that you don't just have the option of not being in the media and joining it full time. I, I think that social media for better, for worse, anyone can, can have a platform. So how you use your voice is up to you, but there definitely is an opportunity to use your voice, even if you're not you know, working full time for a newsroom. Uh, let me, I'm going to try, I know we have to, we have to conclude in a minute or two. So let me just, uh, there were so many additional great questions and what I would ask uh, your permission, all of you, for us to keep track of your comments and your questions. And there's something that we as a group can chew on as we move forward. Um, so if I didn't get to your question, it's not because it wasn't a good one. They're all good ones. Um, yeah, Laura and I just talk too much. It's our fault. It's totally not. 
Um, I can't, I used to read quickly. I can't read these things so quickly. Um, but but uh, there was a good, a good question. I'm gonna try to paraphrase it without, without uh, massacring it. Um, you know, do we get concerned, are, are we concerned about on the left that people state positions that we don't appreciate or is the real problem that the that other people do not call other people in that party do not call them out that is you're going to always have people who make statements that you that you think are anti-semitic or whatever whatever but is is it is there possible pressure or is there pressure point on the people who should be saying things and who aren't where you know can, can you a portion dis distribute kind of what's what where the responsibilities are there you know I, i'm not sure how you would apportion it but there is a a very uh well-established phenomenon back in the days of you know when uh, american communist party uh activism pod enemy agosh you know no enemies on the left and the attitude was you don't criticize people who are on your side of the aisle even when you think they're doing something wrong because that's just going to give more strength or encouragement to people, to the bad people on the other side of the aisle. I think there's, I think there's a serious element of that. Um, and I would say, I mean, I, I think it's a problem on both sides. I think that's more of a problem on the left, even today. I'm not saying anybody's a communist. That's not, that's not uh, what, what, what this means. But I think that there's a feeling, uh, when Donald Trump was in the White House and virtually anything that came out of his mouth or out of his Twitter feed, or you know, or out of his press conferences, immediately provoked a furious backlash, often perfectly justifiable by his political opponents. Uh, I think that that in in an environment like that, there was a strong feeling that when you have someone on the left who's saying something uh, uh, that deserves to be called out, you don't do it because that's just going to give more strength to Trump and his people. I think that's a dangerous. Uh, 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 you know, a, a dangerous cycle for people to get caught in if you're trying to be, um, if you're trying to be principled, if you're trying to be uh, honest and not just be partisan. Um, so I'm not sure how to apportion it between the two pieces of it. I think that the, I mean, the two pieces that you're talking about are, are pretty closely related, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a danger that we all have to, uh, it's a temptation that we all have to resist. Police your own side. It, it's never been more important than it is now. If you see or hear people on your side of the spectrum saying or doing the wrong thing, speak up about it. Be the one who, who makes an issue of it. And and if you find that you can occasionally reach across the aisle and lend support to people that you normally on most issues don't agree with because they're saying the right thing, find a reason to do it. Make it your business to do it. Uh, try to you know try to bridge the gap instead of simply always defending the gap and preventing it from being narrowed. All right, fair enough. Laura, any final thoughts? And I'm going to then uh, turn the program over to back to Terry. Any? Yeah, I mean, I I think Jeff answered the question um, perfectly well. I you know I would just encourage everyone to I would reiterate what Jeff said. It's much more powerful when an argument against bad behavior comes from within the family than outside of the family. So I think we all within you know, a liberal democracy have a responsibility to constantly be not only challenging our own ideas, but in ensuring that the groups we affiliate with align with our values. And it is increasingly challenging no matter what party you are in, but I think it's a privilege and an important responsibility. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay, Terry, what can I, uh, can I turn it back to you? Right, Terry, can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, I wanna thank our speakers Fran and, 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 uh, and Fran, um, Jeff and Laura, uh, thank you for sharing your perspectives with us tonight. Um, certainly a different perspective than what we've heard so far and uh, really an eye opener for me. So thank you again for being with us. Um, I, I wanna share with everyone um, tonight uh, what's gonna happen with our scholar in residence um, on April 1st, 2nd and 3rd with Rachel Fish. 
Um, so uh, all of the um, information is on the Temple of Muna website, um, templeofmuna.org. But I just wanted to share that the titles of what Rachel's going to be talking about. Um, she's going to begin with defining anti-Semitism and talking about the different definitions, IRA and Nexus and uh, Jerusalem. Um, then she's going to talk about the historical transformation of Jew hatred from a religion to a people and a state. Um, then uh, on again, the next topic is exploring the intersection of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, where they diverge and where they converge. Um, she's going to meet with our teens and, and their parents and talk about navigating anti-Semitism in real life and online. And on Sunday morning, she's going to wrap it up and talk about Jewishness in the next generation. So uh, I think that that sort of pulls together a lot of the topics that we've been uh, exploring all year long. And uh, I hope uh, everybody should know who, whether you belong to Temple of Moon or not, um, all of the talks will be um, live streamed. So you're welcome to watch it online. Uh, if you'd like to join us in person, uh, you're welcome to come to Temple of Moon for Shabbat services um, or Sunday morning for a brunch. Um, and we look forward to, to seeing everybody participate as well. Um, tonight's session was uh, recorded. We will send it out to all those who participated and we thank you for coming um, and big thanks to our speakers and for Fran who pulled it all together. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. This was great. Thank you very having much. Us. We really appreciate it.